So please, a large round of applause for Ari. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. I know it's straight after lunch. Um, so, oh yeah, so sorry about that. Um, thanks for coming to my talk. I know it's straight after lunch. Um, the, so on the Glossy, I'm going to talk about CD, but in reality it's more about um, internal tooling. I think many of us probably maintain internal tooling tools to help developers get production, uh, their software to production, or enabling other teams to do their jobs and so forth. And um, I recently did a large uh, project to um, an internal tooling project, and I want to talk about that. I've been building these kinds of internal tooling things for years and years, and most of my open source work is around um, helping and facilitating such um, tools being built. So as this tool that we're talking about or that I built is a CD tool, um, I will um, first just have to define what that means. Uh, typically, there's many, many, many definitions for this, and, and no one is necessarily right or wrong. So, but essentially, you use your CI or a manual building or a pipeline or some description to build your artifacts, test them, etc., and then it's about how you get them to production or where they have to go. Uh, this comes in many forms and flavors, so you could say you do something like immutable infrastructure, you rebuild your AMIs and your Docker containers and so forth and deploy it each time, or you have an infrastructure and you are deploying new packages or jar files or targets or something to those environments. Um, you could even join the thing, so you could you could do a mix of both. So you can say, um, you know, regularly you rebuild your infrastructure, and, and in the intermediate time you do a, um, um, an update of the infrastructure. That's fine too. In the specific scenario that I'm talking about, we had to um, deploy RPMs to to large amounts of machines. Uh, we didn't own the machines. We didn't own how often they get redeployed or how they get built or anything like that, so we couldn't do the immutable, immutable kind of deployments. So the environment that this was in, we had hundreds and thousands of machines. They were not ours. They were probably spread across 20 or 30 different teams who own these machines. They take care of building the machines. They take care of fixing the machines. We have no ability to uh, delete files of them if the disks are full or anything like that. Um, so it was quite a hostile environment to work in for, for this kind of thing. And prior to building this tool, a release would take four weeks. And I'm, I'm being quite generous. It's probably closer to six weeks to do a release. Because we had to just go and the whole team is tools down and everyone's deploying RPMs to machines and using various automation tools and whatever we could cobble together. Um, and this would happen once, maybe twice a year, and uh, we did 70 or 80% success. I think the last time I was on, on that process, we had something like 78% of the machines got successfully updated, um, which is not a success at all by any measure. Um, the effect of that is that we had maybe 30 or 40 different versions of our software across the fleet. So some small team comes to us saying they want a specific new feature put in, we would put the feature in and we would coordinate with them to deploy just to do their thousand or two or three machines. Um, and so they would have a version that's unlike anyone else. And um, it, it's, it's just really bad. Everything about it was very, very bad. We were quite a small team. We were about 10 people. And um, there were three teams within this team. And they all were doing their own way to do this as well. This means that we obviously we couldn't work on any new features because if you can't roll it out, what's the point? Um, this team started fairly early on um, when the fleet was significantly smaller, and so they made architectural decisions then, which of course doesn't pan out to when you grow to half a million machines or whatever the number is. Um, so, but they were not able to make architectural decisions or architectural changes to that very early architecture because there's no way to re to reliably roll out a new version of the software, or upgrade the APIs, or support new APIs, or deprecate old, old APIs. Um, because there was such a long tail of, of different versions of the software out on the fleet, uh, we of course couldn't test any change that we were making against all of those versions. There's, there were versions out there that was made two or three years ago, long before people invested into spec testing for those versions or and so forth. And so we would make what we were thought would be a completely harmless change, and then a week later we'll heard there's just vast amounts of machines that's gone broken. 
um, huge disruptions, and you know people were were fairly unhappy. Um, so it was during one of these six weeks uh, deployment phases where I thought, you know, let's see if we can make this better. And people had up times and down times. You know, we're waiting for machines to deploy, so people have time to to try out some different things, and we can talk. And we worked on this in between, in between that kind of um, <clears throat> upgrade cycle. And so we set about looking at the common patterns across the teams, and we were lucky in that we were all Red Hat based uh, machines, so everything was already in RPM. And because we had to go on so many different teams with our, with our equipment. We already put all our software in, like, let's say, opt Acme, some you know, some kind of directory specific to our team, and we packaged up all our dependencies already, um, all lived there. So that that was very nice. That that we didn't have to attack um, to create some kind of a of a new standard for that stuff that was already there. Um, the software was fairly typical: install it, configure it, start it, or maybe it's a cron job, so maybe you add a cron, um, and then you all check it. This is all. All fairly standard stuff. Um, already there were shell scripts because the, when a team builds a new machine, they would run our install script. And already there were check scripts because when we get a Jira saying this machine or these 5,000 machines aren't working, we would tell them to go run their half check script. So these things already existed. They were in different places. They worked differently. Um, they weren't in the same directory where you could easily find them. But we had we had a fairly good set of um, set of inputs to work with. And so when you think about how, you know, in that scenario they were deploying all of their software, um, it's a simple, well not simple, but it's a finite state machine that basically looks like that. Um, the first time we run on the machine or if any of the inputs change, so if, um, you know, we change the version we wish to deploy or the configuration that needs to be deployed, uh, we go to the dock unknown. If we move on to install, install the version that needs to happen. If it's already installed, it's now up. Um, configure it, and then just check it, help check it regularly. Now, that turns out, you know, we know from using Puppet and Chef and so forth that this is just how software works. So this is not, this is nothing, nothing groundbreaking about saying that. Um, but what we had is we had no regular health checks of the software. There was maybe seven or eight RPMs, and we literally just waited for people to complain. That's it. If it doesn't work, we would tell them to run the check scripts by hand. Um, and so what I was looking at was how can we build a tool that does this effectively. We couldn't say use Puppet because we didn't own the machines. And we already had some machines with two versions of Puppet and maybe Ansible and Chef on it. Um, because everyone has their hands in these machines. And so we, we couldn't go, here's a new configuration um, platform. We couldn't, we couldn't say install Ruby for us. We couldn't say install anything new for us. So we had to go, um, and there's a bit of a theme in this conference here, we had to use shell scripts. So um, effectively. Now, of course, install of an RPM machines when you have many Red Hat machines, they're all the same. If it's not the right version, RPM or YAM, is YAM install. If it needs to downgrade, remove it, install the right version, upgrade, YAM upgrade. Easy stuff. Works for all the machines. Uh, configure and check, that would depend on the individual projects that we were deploying, and so we were thinking how can we um, allow them to deliver the logic for the configure and the checks, and so that we can write a generic tool that works for any pieces of software. So um, we asked them to just make a shell script that lives in a standard directory that takes, yeah, I say JSON, it, it doesn't need to be JSON, any bytes really. Um, and that script needs to do whatever this particular piece of software needs to do to configure itself. So um, we didn't want to prescribe, like I said, Papa Toshe or anything like this. Um, we had to meet the teams where they were. And they already had scripts, some of them was in Python, some of them was in Shell. There was even one Java program, we just, we just had to support it all. Um, and finally, the, the check, we put it in the same location, predictable location. When I need to check, I know exactly where to go. So we asked them to make a small change to their RPMs, uh, which is, they had to name their, well, let me go to the next slide. We had to name all our packages by Acme, where Acme is like the tool, the, the team name, um, a component, which is metadata, and we had to use Sember for versions. Uh, a couple of teams had to change their versioning, but it wasn't the end of the world. Um, they had to add two files to their packages, and for the rest of the package, we don't care what's in there. We, 
I install RPM, I never have to know what's in the RPM, or I never have to care what's inside the RPM. So they have to add those two files, put it for us into a standard location, and then you know, as we go through that little state machine, we'll call it when necessary. Um, we call this a uh, uh, packaging contract, and it's very simple stuff. So check, you, you're supposed to only check what happens on your local machine. Don't talk to the network. The reason for that is because I would call this at a very, very high concurrency. If there was a 50,000 node data center, I would call it on 50,000 nodes at the same time. Um, we, would, we would literally all check a DC in one second. Uh, so don't talk to the network because that will go bad. Um, simple zero, non-zero exit. I don't care what the output is. Um, so most of them already had this. Some of them had to add support to disable network checks and remote API checks and so forth, but it was pretty easy. Configure one's a bit more complex, um, but basically all it does is it has to configure, reconfigure. So even if it even if it was previously configured, it has to reconfigure the app, because it turns out that if we go through our old JIRAs, anytime when someone said it was broken, they ran a check, it was broken, we tell them just re just rerun the configure. That's the remediation. So we already had a remediation flow, which was reconfigure, and all of the reconfigure logic was. Um, it, it would reconfigure everything. It would make sure the services are there, make sure the cron jobs are there, make sure the configuration file is in correct format, make sure all the desired keys are there, etc. Um, here it was okay to access the network because we had machines that um, had to register with a central API. And so we would call this at like 200 machines at a time or 300 machines at a time. We were mainly constrained at how fast the YUM servers were, and the YUM servers were pretty bad, so I couldn't do those uh, very fast. Um, but that's it. And so if, uh, if a team um, changed their software with these two very basic features, we hoped that we could solve their um, once a year deployment nightmare. Um, so about the configuration, obviously we want to be able to centrally drive the configuration. So this was a tool to enable the developers. So, you know, Git repository, it has some standard. Um, I'm the author of Hira, so it's not a surprise that this is going to look a bit like a Hira repository. Um, you have a manifest of JSON, which is what you see at the bottom, and that tells you just which packages and which versions to install on the site, and the CD tool would read that. And at the top, um, if you install version 1 to 3 of metadata, you'll get that config. Everything else would get the common config installed. And again, here we're showing it's JSON files, but it could be, I'd, I never even looked at those files, it's just by type. Whatever they wanted to do, they can do. Um, so this turned out looking like Hira eventually, so we could break the business down into, into tiers and pre-prod and um, infrastructure teams and software as a service teams and cloud teams, whatever. Anyone who delivers software, we would add them a tier there, and they would have the ability to manage what goes out and where and how those are configured. Um, so yeah, obviously we have pre-prod, and we're testing a different version of um, the software or the next version of the software in pre-production. As I said, it was a Git repository. Uh, developers had a PR-based workflow. As a PR is there, they would, um, we would validate the, the manifests or you know, good JSON and the minimum set of packages that we need for a functioning site are there. Of course, they can, they can install more, but we had a minimal set we had to do. Um, when someone changes any of the, of the package inputs, we, um, we would notify via Slack if there's a commit, so everyone would know there's something going out. And this repository would simply go onto like a, let's say an S3 bucket, they didn't have S3, they had something else, but um, we put it on an S3 bucket and all the sites would get the local copy of that repository. And so all through the, through the, through the site we would have um, the desired state of what the CD system has to do. And that's about where the developers' involvement of this would need to end in terms of rolling out new software. They would basically do their stuff however they want to do it because we didn't control the software development lifecycle. Maybe they use CI, maybe use whatever. Eventually it ends up in the YAML repositories that was run by Corp. And um, this manifest and configuration allows them to control the various sites. So that was not a very major change and, and, and specifically designed to meet the people where they are. Um, already using the tools they're using, the languages they're using, not prescribing any kind of um, you have to use pop you have to use shape, etc. And that's, that was pretty critical to the success of, of most internal toolings. So how do we get these things out to the fleet? Um, 
It was a very complex environment. We had many hundreds of machines, hundreds of thousands of machines. Um, we, we were working on the assumption that there would be around two million machines eventually. Um, so whatever we designed had to work on two million nodes. We had many, many locations and environments. This was um, government, FedRAMP, US government, UK government, all over the place. Uh, lots of PCI environments, lots of really old, crusty, hand-built data centers where there was never any automation, um, all the way to Kubernetes clusters and literally anything in between you can imagine. Uh, it was a very, very, very big and varied environment. Um, we had some constraints in that when a machine boots, within two minutes we should be done with it. All our software should be installed because the software that we were delivering was um, an automation system, a workflow-based automation system that the rest of the organization used to build their stuff. So if they are provisioning a customer, we can't take hours to get our stuff there before they start installing their software, which also takes a long time. So we had to be done with any new machine, any new container, anything that starts up anywhere has to be done in two minutes um, across thousands of locations. And many of the locations I couldn't access. I'm, I'm a British citizen, I don't get any access to American government networks. So, um, the other problem is if you, if you have that many machines, it, it implies you have many, many broken machines. So, so this had to be stable in the face of, of that level of uncertainty. We used, I mean, I'm fairly certain we had more machines with full disks than most people had machines. It's, it's insane. But not only that, but because we don't own the machines, it was other teams owning the machines, we didn't own the life cycles either. We would sit and see 10,000 machines being turned off and have no idea why they're being turned off. It's, it's, did, did we break something? Who knows? We have no idea of what's going on with the machines and whether they all come up. Like, once we saw 10,000 machines go up, 5,000 comes back. What's going on? We don't know. We can't access the machines, but we have to just survive that somehow. Um, and of course, it has to be continuous. So any, any, if a developer wants to make a change, we, we have to get it out um, soon. And we have to be able to, to, to deal with bug outages and so forth. I mean, if we are harmonizing the versions across the entire fleet, everyone runs the same software, um, you should be able to get a bug, a bug fix out very, very quickly in that scenario. So um, that was the, the problem we faced, and this is kind of why it took weeks and weeks and weeks to do a rollout with, with, with the tooling that people had, because there's just so many environments, access is difficult. I mean, my SSH config was just hundreds and hundreds of lines of just bastion setups. It was just insane. It was impossible to access anything. Um, now, this is not a Coria pitch, but I'm the author of Coria, and we already had Coria rolled out to their fleet. Um, and Coria is a framework for building these kind of things on, so we built it with Coria. You could probably do this with Salt Stack or a number of other tools, or C config management to see how do you pronounce your tool? MGMT. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying, and this is why there's only like three slides about Coria in this talk. This is not a pitch for Coria, it's about internal tooling. Um, so, I'm the author of Coria, and Coria is exactly about these kinds of things. It's a framework for building um, backplanes, management backplanes, orchestration tools, um, programmable infrastructure, solving these kinds of problems. It's evented, so we use um, CNCF um, cloud events format for publishing events, like machine starts up, we'll get a, a small little packet across the network saying there's a new machine. And so I can move on to the next step of configuring that machine, for instance. Um, it lets you create programmable infrastructures, so we support, um, if you have Coria deployed, you can write playbooks using Puppet DSL, uh, it's like a plan, and that's kind of interactive. Someone has developed a playbook and you can run it, you can give it some input on the CLI. It's not for programming. Uh, you can access it from the CLI. So there's CLI tools that's generically interacting with your network that, that runs Coria. You can write um, programs using Ruby. And those are maybe not necessarily for very long running ones. They're for short term of things, but maybe, you know, rather run for an hour or two just because of nature of Rolf Ruby. He's very good at that. So you can interact with your network from Ruby. And finally, we support Go as well. And this was written in Go, um, more suited to, you know, continuous long term type stuff. It's got all of the enterprise, AAA authentication, authorization, and auditing stuff done. You can do 
single authentication to SAML. We support HSM, so if you have YubiKeys, the first time you interact with the network, you have to press your YubiKey. Um, we support custom CAs, we support the Puppet CA, all, all kinds of crazy security stuff that um, enterprises need. I have to, we support most of those. Um, it's kind of a um, descendant from M Collective, which, which is something I wrote years ago. Um, M Collective had some scalability issues in, in, in modern terms. Um, Corea, if you had a, a $40 a month Linode, you could manage 50,000 machines. Um, we've tested it to single lands with 300,000 nodes on a single LAN. No one, no one should be doing 300,000 machines on a LAN, but it's good to know we can do it. Um, and I support a federation model where I can create networks of networks, and I've tested that to 17,000 uh, federated networks. So, for for all intents and purposes, and certainly for the for the team that I'm talking about, um, it's it's scalable as far beyond anything they would ever they would ever build. Um, so I mentioned that it's a programmable infrastructure. Yes, I'm Go code. Um, the first om.mask. The tool was called om. So om is a, is a library was called om. We connect to the to the network. This sets up networks. The security connects to the middleware it requires. Does all the YubiKey things or certificate things or whatever you need to do. Um, I mentioned we were doing configuration of these packages and we were passing in certain bytes. So here I'm calling the configure function across the network. Um, I'm configuring the component called metadata, which is the RPM you saw earlier, and I'm passing in a, a string of bytes um, into the configuration thing that will go across the network. And then at the end I pass the, the results. As for interacting with Corea, that is all of the code you would need in the in the in the centralized orchestrator to to communicate with the network. Let's assume that the configuration step is very fast. All you do maybe is take the bytes and stick them in a file. Uh, this code will successfully manage 50,000 nodes in two seconds. Um, and you'll see there's nothing in there about security or addressing or any of these kind of things. Uh, if your security team approves a certain deployment model of it. You configure the libraries, and then this code just works. If they want to change later the security model to something else, this code doesn't need to change. Uh, you change the underlying configuration, and the new security model is in place. You cannot opt out of security. There's no way to turn it off. If you turn it off, the fleet will think you're just a rogue actor, and they'll ignore you. Um, every action is audited. Every action goes through authorization. We support um, its own authorization format, which is Nice, but quite old now, but we also support the CNCF um, Open Policy Agent. So with Open Policy Agent, you can write quite um, extensive policy that says a certain user or a certain team is only allowed to configure a certain machines within a certain data center, perhaps during a certain time window, uh, perhaps only once a certain person has authorized them. You, you, can, you can come up with literally any kinds of... Um, um, authorization policies you want. You can even in those policies inspect things like someone's calling configure and they're trying to configure metadata but they are in the web server team. They're not allowed to configure metadata. Um, you can be very expressive about the authentication, authorization and um, auditing that it supports. Um, so using this, this style of Go code, we built a central orchestrator that was um, an instance of it was deployed into every data center, and so if we, or not just data center VPCs, you know, all this kind of stuff, because we had many different, uh, different kind of scenarios, um, but within one network would be one or a pair of the orchestrators that would continuously listen for events, continuously interact with the fleet, continuously half check the fleet, continuously remediate machines that need remediation, um, and that is a background task that no one really um, interacts with. Um, it would read the metadata and the, and the manifest and so forth that I mentioned earlier and just manage the site um, and make sure it's, 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 it's in a space. We would, for instance, if the install step fails, we would just continue to try to install. Um, if, it, if it fails repeatedly, we will only try like five times a day just not to make it worse because if we try to fix a machine with a bad RPM DB continuously, you could make it worse. Um, <laughs> So we would try once a day, but we will try forever until someone fixes it. We couldn't fix the machines ourselves, so we just had to wait for someone to notice the machines are broken and fix them. Um, so 
the developers would do their git commit and the stuff would roll out. Now that's pretty scary because you're affecting you know, hundreds of thousands of machines, millions of machines potentially, and how do we make it visible and what's actually happening and what can they do if it goes wrong? And that was a large part of, of, the, of the problems we had to solve in, the, in, the, in, the, in creating this tool. So um, Go, of course, can interact with Prometheus, and so we have Prometheus already deployed all over the place. And here you can see we're deploying a particular package. Um, it was doing about 5,500 nodes a minute, and the entire fleet would take an hour. This was about half the fleet, um, because they were two big business tiers, and we couldn't, they didn't want us to share the, share the metrics of all the teams in one, in one cluster. So in reality, we would do about 12,000 um, machines provisioned per minute. You'll see at the, at the bottom, at the back there, there's uh, the, what's it, like 400, 500 packages per minute. Um, we had to go quite slow because we couldn't make the central API go fast enough for node registrations and because we couldn't make the YAM servers go fast enough. So as far as I'm concerned, while those are really nice numbers, they're very slow. Um, I could do the entire site in a minute if I could make the YAM, YAM servers fast enough. Um, and that's, that's kind of the, 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 the strength of Coreas in, in those kind of speed. So when we do the installs, we govern it down to 200 machines at a time. Um, but when we do a health checks, I can health check the whole DC or the whole fleet in a minute, no problem. Um, so as, it's, as you see it there, that's actually many, many different locations. And you just see that these are um, each data center doing their thing. So it's all the data centers operating independently and, and they, they, even if the DC is cut off from the rest of the world, it will continue to do its thing with the last information that it's had available to itself. And so the graph, the previous graph was made up of all the data centers running concurrently. And the big orange one is the one that you saw um, that took so long. Um, there's like, I don't know, 60, 70,000 machines there. Um, but still, we were deploying the entire fleet in an hour. That's from once a year to an hour is pretty cool. Um, I mentioned internally there was a bunch of state machines. And the way that state machines work is you define your state, so you should install. And then there's various events that can fire that moves the machine between these states. And so this is an in a view of the state machines internal. So developers can look at this and say, we've just triggered that 50,000 machines has realized they're out of date, and so they will then move into the state where they need an install, and it will start installing them. Um, the, the orange is install OK, so those are machines that passed. There was 33 of them that failed install, and some other stuff. Um, so we could see the internals of this application exactly, and we could alert if there was a spike, for instance, um, these are install failures, so this is install failure events. These purple, purple peaks, that's the same one every half an hour apart, that's when the tool runs. The tool did a, a check across the entire fleet there and found, what's that, 30-ish bad machines. Um, they had read-only disks, I remember that. Um, and so using this, the, the developers didn't need necessarily to access any of the sites. Uh, we, we couldn't require them to access the sites to, to do deploys because we couldn't access half the place. Um, many of them were, like I said, government, and we, we couldn't access those things. Or we would have one, one person who was able to access that site, but it's his day off. You know, what can we do? Um, so we had to build it so it drives itself. If there's something wrong, we needed to give the people the ability to log in, be it us or you know, first hands or whatever. They were, you would want to do things like do an ad hoc health check, just check the, the whole data center while I wait. Um, or do check the whole data center while I wait for one component only or all the components. Or run a report saying of this component, which ones are old versions. Show me all the host names that are failing installs. Show me all the failed machines that's failing checks. Just the host names, hand that over to ops for fixing the machines. Um, so we made the CLI that was installed in every DC. And people could do, like I said, health checks, configures, et cetera. They can do an ad hoc install if they wish, for some other reason, it may be tested. Um, and they can also lock machines, so if there was a subset of machines that we know 
this is a sensitive time for them. We can construct um, filters on the CLI and lock those machines, and the CD system will leave them alone uh, for a period of 24 hours because people forget to unlock them. So I don't want to create random islands. Um, so we had this this kind of tooling in every DC, which was not nice. Um, you can see here I do um, OM check metadata. It would go, reach out to the network, find all the machines that has the metadata component installed, health check them, and report. Um, so this was my lab. We had 1,200 machines there, and some of them were in a bad way. And you can see we health checked the whole fleet, and there's three of them that's bad. And it takes a second. Um, we can also do reports across versions. And so the health check was quite slow because it starts up Rubies, and people write some things in Java or whatever, I don't know, um, where a uh, version query is very quick, 0.4 seconds for 1,000 machines, because uh, we're just asking the RPM DB. Um, so this kind of stuff, and over, th over time we added more features to that, and we added tooling where the end user teams could interact with the fleet and um, query it. We had those graphs, they were obviously um, emitting events as well, so we had a central stream of events for all of the data centers all over the place. Um, which machines are failing in real time, we can subscribe to that event stream. Um, report on, on, on you know if there's up, upticks on 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 failures. Uh, we can do we can query for instance out of a streaming database like Kafka type thing. Um, all machines that's failed in the last 24 hours get their host names and it over to ops. And and that's all cool, but still um, things can go wrong. Obviously, someone's going to commit something that they don't want to go out and. Within an hour, we will have installed this on, a, on, let's say, half a million machines or two million machines. And so you really need like a big button that you can press that stops everything. Um, Corea is a thing that you can embed, embed a management agent into any Go application. And it has a couple of um, things like circuit breakers. Um, it can emit data out of the, out of the binary it's embedded into for, for metrics and such. You can do things like change the logging levels on the fly. Um, circuit break I mentioned. So if we realize we are doing something like a, a packet that has to go out that shouldn't go out, we, we would not be able to SSH to those bastions and everything before it's done. It's impossible. Um, but via this management backplane, we would say backplane, OM, OM being the, the CD tool, pause. They would, if they were mid-installing a batch of 200 machines, they will finish the 200 machines, so we don't leave anything in like a, a half state, but then they would all stop. And that would hit all data centers, all machines, all places where, where the CD tool were running, they would all just stop. Um, so it's nice to have a little safety guard like that. Um, even places we couldn't SSH to, etc., they were all there. And we had the same tool able to, to stop various components that we were running, various kind of internal tooling, all embedded the same kind of backplane. So one way to hit the red button, um, rather than someone waking up going, how do we stop this bad thing from happening? There's only one way to do it. Really good. Um, so it, it took me two weeks to write this all. Um, because I wrote it on Coria. Uh, Coria being a framework for this, it takes care of, I don't have to worry about how do I make something scale to 2 million nodes, which is hard. <laughs> it's very hard. So if you, if you had to sit out and write a thing that scales to 2 million nodes, you're there for a few years. Um, it already understands logging, networking, addressing. It has all the security stuff built in. Because we already had it deployed, um, Security teams had already vetted the model of how it works. And once it's there, we can build a number of these applications really quite easily. So we implemented this whole CD system in two weeks, including updating the packages and so forth. Um, it's one binary that we had to deploy, so it was really easy to install into all the data centers where we already had Puppet. And so because it takes about an hour, I can make it go faster, we we're able to do 20 deploys a day to the entire fleet. No one wants to do 20 deploys a day. But it's a good number to know because when you need to do a bug fix deploy, you need to be able to do it. And so no one should aim for 20 deploys a day, so that's not the goal, but you should be able to do a deploy when you need to. Um, the first time we ran this, which was right after, after one of these big six weeks things, we took it from 75% to above 98% success. Um, we were able to query the event streams for the bunch of bad, bad nodes. I sent a 
big old CSV file over to ops, and it took them months, but eventually things got fixed, and you know we we went way above 99% success, which was unprecedented. Um, I mentioned we tested this to 300,000 nodes on the LAN. That's that's much more than this particular company would ever build onto a LAN, um, and so. They favor smaller lands with machines, but many, many um, networks. And so for their particular use case, there's no upper limit to scale. We could, we could run this on 10 million machines and continue to work. Um, and everything is secure, ordered, authorized, um, under our back, etc. For the team in question, um, we ended up settling around three, two, sometimes four deploys in a week. Um, previously, people's, people's reaction was like, well, there's a mistake, there's a bug that affects only this class of machine in the fleet, and they tried to upgrade that just that one class of machine in the fleet. And that's actually just the worst possible thing to do. The, the, the path of least resistance was to do a full fleet deploy across all the machines, which which Took some getting used to, but once they got used to it, it was just amazing because we started doing architectural changes, we started upgrading uh, the backends, we started rewriting the APIs that the machine's registering into. The 0.2 or 0.3% of the fleet that wasn't upgrading was beyond repair, so we just don't care about those machines. So for the first time in almost five years that this team has existed, they were able to do big architectural changes. Um, I mentioned we were above 99% harmonized versions, which was also a first, um, and you know, all just worked much better. Things were more stable and so forth. And it really, this shows that um, you know, as operations people or as platform builders or as teams who maybe create a Nomad cluster or a Kubernetes cluster or something for your for your um, development teams, you can have just an unimaginably large impact on on the quality of life of the rest of the people in your business. And you know, as it turns out, the, the whole business benefits because, because we, um, you know, we're able to actually improve things. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much the talk. Um, I'm, I, I, we have like eight minutes, so we can take many questions or whatever. Um, unfortunately, this particular tool is not open source. I can open source it, but I think it's, um, it's maybe too specific to their particular use case. Um, to open source the actual CD tool, but of course, all of the supporting other applications that we used to build that is all open source, um, as it was built on top of Corea, which is an open source framework. And um, yeah, that's about it.